Okay, so I know a couple of kids are grabbing printing here, but I'm going to get started here because I want to give you guys as much time today as I can to do some, some work on stuff. So the plan for the last two days here, uh, today we're going to do a set of notes on the periodic table. Tomorrow I'm going to give you guys some work time, uh, just a whole class for you to get caught up on things like uh, your lab, your, uh, your lab safety um, kind of project. You can also keep working on your assignment and do all of this in preparation for next week, Monday, when you guys are going to write your first quiz. Okay, so let me say that one more time. Next Monday is our first quiz. Okay, so we have a class today. I'm going to do this lesson and then try to give you some work time. Tomorrow I'm going to give you a whole class to do catch-up, to finish whatever it is you want to work on. Then you guys get a long weekend, really long weekend. You get Thursday and Friday off. You guys know this? Yeah. And then, and Saturday and Sunday, yeah. Don't come back. I'm not here those days either. And then uh, next week, Monday, though, we're going to try our first quiz. Okay? Just from the first four topics, yeah. So, okay, why don't we get started here? I want to talk through some of these notes here. So can I snag your attention? I want to talk through some of the notes here. I could talk to the notes as well. Are right, you guys ready? So advice I would give here. Hi. Uh, first of all, if you could, try to print off the notes before class. That usually helps. So you're not walking in with a big pile of them. Uh, other advice I might give, the reason why I give you guys all these notes, make sure you're really part of the conversation, okay? I don't want you guys spending your time today writing down a whole bunch of stuff. I want you guys to be listening, engaged, writing down the extra stuff we can fill in and maybe highlighting stuff. Does that make sense? So Today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the periodic table. And I've got one that I've passed to each of you guys, plus there's one way at the back wall. And once in a while, I might head over there and kind of point some stuff out. Do I have a meter stick? Oh, oh squeaky. Oh, this is my shoe. So, <laughs> okay, so let's start with uh, what I've got on the first slide here. We reviewed yesterday a bunch of scientists to accomplish noteworthy stuff. And one of them was Dmitry Mendeleev. Lab's really loud. Uh, in, 19, in 1869, he came up with a brilliant idea that we still use to this day. He figured that he should combine similar properties of elements. He wrote them down on cards, and he arranged them into a grid. And that grid, not only did he decide to make them into columns that go up and down and rows that go side by side, but one of the most amazing things to me is that he left a few blanks. And then years later, scientists actually found the missing elements. I think that's so cool that he was able to make that sort of prediction. Now, Mendeleev's original table looks something like what I've got listed here, which is a little bit crude. It's not nearly as, as elegant and as, as um, even colored as we make our modern periodic table, where we try to organize things based on um, the, the metals versus non-metals and solids, liquids, and gases. But he more or less made kind of like a little chart like this. My goal today is very simple. I need to explain to you guys how a modern periodic table works so that if I give you a copy like you guys have in front of you, you can interpret it and understand what we're talking about. Okay? So it's a very basic goal. We need to know how this periodic table works. Right. So the first thing I need you guys to know is that your periodic table is arranged based on something called the atomic number. You guys good? something called the atomic number. Okay, Even though there's rows and even though there's columns, e every single element on your periodic table has a number next to it. And if you guys can see on your periodic table nearby here, start in the very, very top, what is that, top left-hand corner, see how hydrogen is literally number one. Okay, Now then there's a big gap from hydrogen. If you go all the way across over to helium, that's where number two is. And then just like when you read a book, once you've finished a row, you then start on the next row down. So number three is over here in the corner, lithium. And then four, beryllium. So, so you read it just like you would a book. Across, and then once you finish going across, go down to the next column. Now I'm going to head to the back here because i got to point something out on the big table. So I have my microphone so you guys can still hear on the video. So if you guys can see, here's number one, number two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Now that makes sense, but there's something that kids get a little confused about. It's this stuff down here. So I want to explain this very, very beginning here. Okay. Some kids think that there are there are nine rows in the periodic table. They think this is row one. So there's a one here. Row two. 
Row three, row four, six, row seven. Do yours do that too? They don't. Okay, but some tables actually put like one, two, three, five, six, seven here. Some kids think that these are rows eight and nine, and that's actually not true. The reason why this gets confusing is look at the numbering scheme. 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 72. What the heck? We just skipped a whole bunch of numbers. Yeah. So here's how this works. To save space, what they've done is they've made all of these elements right here. What they really should do is you should shift this whole table way over there, and these two rows should be sitting right in here. But then the table would be really, really, really wide apart. So what they've done is they've taken a whole bunch of elements out of here from 57 to 71, and they write them down below. And it's purely to save space. Does that make sense? If the table were actually drawn to scale, like this corner right here would be like way the heck over here. Because all of this stuff would have to get slid over, and these two rows right here would slide right in there. And it would be really wide. Well, but then it wouldn't fit all that well. Makes sense. So there are not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rows. There's only seven. And really it goes like this. If you start counting them by atomic number, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 71, 72, 73. Is that clear to everybody? That's one of the most confusing things kids find about the periodic table is they're like, why the heck is there this section? Okay. Now on your table here, can you guys see how there's this little black solid line right here? That's kind of, they even like did a little arrow there kind of showing that right in here is where all of these guys go. So minus the fact that it's a little confusing there, the table literally is numbered from 1 to about 114 or 15, whatever we're up to right now. And it goes in order. That number that we number them by, we call it the atomic number. So this would be a, a definition or a word I need you guys to know. It's called the atomic number. Everybody gets a number. Okay. Now, all of these things on the periodic table, if I haven't made it clear, they're, they're all of our elements. They're our basic building blocks. Okay. Now, there are many different categories on the periodic table I need you to be aware of. Okay. The first one, we, we need to know the difference between something that's naturally occurring and something that is synthetic. Okay. I'm going to highlight some of these things here. I need you guys to know whether something is naturally occurring or whether it's synthetic. Which then asks the first question, well, Chris, how do I know the difference? Because you guys might notice there's a whole bunch of different colors on here. And I'll get to the different colors in a bit, but none of these colors are about natural or synthetic. So here's how you tell the difference. A lot of students, they believe that the synthetic ones are the ones that are down here at the bottom. Okay. But that's actually not true either, because I just told you that these ones down here at the bottom really belong in there. So I need for you guys to look on the periodic table. I'm going to draw out like a square of one of them here. Pretend that the square right here is hydrogen. It looks like this. One, then there's a 2.2, a big H, the word hydrogen. Up in the corner, there's like 1.01, .01, and there's a couple of charges listed. Here's what I need you guys to look at. If you want to figure out whether something is naturally occurring or synthetic, it's all about this number right here. Can you guys find that number on most of the squares here? I want you to compare it to a different one. This one is going to be tetranetium, which is number 43. I'm going to draw 43 for you. 43, tetranetium, has a 2.1, a TC, it's tetranetium. Here's the big difference. Can you guys see how this number up in the top right-hand corner is in brackets there? That is what helps you identify whether it's synthetic or not. Okay. There are some elements that are synthetic because the number right here, we call it the atomic molar mass. We're not going to use it in this course yet. But if this number here is in a bracket, it's synthetic. Which means that it's like it's not natural. Humans had to like try to derive it in a lab, probably using uh, nuclear reactions. Whereas if it's got decimal numbers here, it's natural. Now, in general, many of the elements that are synthetic are actually they are down here in the bottom section. Okay. 
So I'm going to go back up to the big periodic table here. You guys can kind of compare. This periodic table back here, by the way, does list the difference. Can you guys see how tetranetium right here is like white with like the outline around it? And I don't know if you guys can see it, but right there, that's the 98, and it's in brackets, just like this one right here and this one right here. So the in brackets number lets you know that it's um, synthetic, basically. Whereas if it's not in brackets, like say this one right here or this one right here or any of these ones here, those are natural. So, yes, most of these ones down here plus that one are synthetic, but like this one right here, it's not synthetic because it's not in brackets. Does that make sense? One of the things that chemists are trying to work on, if you get to numbers like 110, 11, 12, 13, 14, they've actually put um, some elements here. These ones, are they haven't really been found yet. You might notice that there's like UUN, UUU, UUB, UUQ. Those ones are ones that scientists are trying to make. Like literally they're trying to make new elements, almost like... Uh, um, like like a superhero movie. I think they did it in like an Iron Man movie where you try to make a new element. They're actually trying to work on that. And those are placeholders for when one day this element gets made or discovered or figured out, then they'll hopefully give it a new name. So your guys' table actually stops at 111, doesn't it? But if you were to look up at the table right there, um, there's like 111, 112, 114. They're kind of leaving a spot there for when they eventually try to find the next ones. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So how do you know if it's natural or synthetic? You have to look for that number. Now, you don't even need to know what the number means. All that matters is, is it in a bracket or not. If it's in a bracket, it's synthetic. If it's not in a bracket, it's natural. Easy enough? Okay. Ooh, where did my pen here is? The next categories I need you guys to know about are known as either the metals, the non-metals, or the metalloids. There's actually three categories. There's metals, there's non-metals, and there's metalloids. And I'd actually like to go back a slide here. Although I have slides here on metals, non-metals, and metalloids, I'd like to go back to this. Oh, now it's really small. Well, this should work. Can you guys see the picture of the periodic table right here? Okay. This one here is color-coded it so that we know which ones are metals, which ones are non-metals, and which ones are metalloids. Everything basically on this side of the table over here is considered to be a metal. Now, I need to make sure I'm really clear about something here. Metal does not mean solid. Most people think that metal means that it's a solid, but that's actually not true. There is one element that's kind of over here on this side of the periodic table. Now, can you guys see how on yours, everything there is basically the yellow color? Except for mercury, yeah. Mercury is a liquid. If you look at its color code, it's a liquid, but it's still considered to be a metal. So it's not true to say that all metals are solid. That's actually not true. But for the most part, if it's metal, it's probably solid. Okay. So everything that's over here on this side of the table in yellow on yours, we call the metals, with one exception. Up here in the corner, see hydrogen? Sometimes periodic tables don't even put hydrogen in that same spot there. Can you see on the back table there how hydrogen has been kind of like lifted up off the table, how there's like a little bit of a gap there? Sometimes hydrogen is like removed slightly. So hydrogen is the one exception. It is not considered a metal. It's actually a gas. Okay. On this side of the table over here, these things over here are considered to be the non-metals. Okay? And for the most part, if you look on your table, they're going to be the things that are blue, or possibly the other liquid, which is bromine, and they're nonmetals. If I could, I want to go to my next slides here. Most things are metals. Okay, like almost all of the elements on the table are metals. And here are some properties of them. They're strong, they're durable. Do you guys remember what malleable means? A sheet, yep. And ductile? Uh, wires. wires, good, yeah. Yeah. Well, those are properties of metals. As soon as we talk about non-metals, they basically have all of the opposite properties, right? So things like oxygen and fluorine and neon, they're all gases. Do you think you can make oxygen into a sheet? Well, it's a gas. That's not going to work, right? This is the tricky one. They're called the metalloids. They're kind of like the gray area ones. You're either a metal or you're a non-metal. Or what if sometimes you act like a metal and sometimes you don't act like a non-metal? For example... 
what happens if we found an element that, yes, was a good conductor of heat, so I'd say check to that one, but was not malleable? Right? Like, what if it had some properties, but not all of them? So we call those ones metalloids. And for the most part, you guys just need to know which ones they are. So I've actually got them listed right here for you. What I might recommend you guys do is take your periodic table and put a little star next to these ones here. And I'm going to go stand by the back wall and try to help you guys with these. Here are the ones that they're really not a metal or a non-metal. There is a, what's known as a staircase line. You guys can see, hopefully on yours, there's a little black line that kind of alternates. Pretty much everything that touches this staircase is known as a metalloid with one exception. So if you want to write these ones down or highlight them on your table, boron is a metalloid. Right here, boron, number 5B. The only thing that touches the staircase that's not a metalloid is actually aluminum. So don't highlight aluminum. Silicon is a metalloid. Germanium is a metalloid. Arsenic. Antimony. Tellurium. Polonium. Astatine. Okay, like as you go down the staircase, it's almost like you need to go here, 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 like kind of like walk down the stairs. All of the things that are touching are metalloids with one exception. Aluminum is the only one that's not. Aluminum is actually a metal. Of those properties that I had on that previous slide, aluminum checks them all. Okay, we can even go back and look at those properties here now that I'm back at the front. Okay, aluminum is strong, it's durable, it's malleable, it's ductile, it's hard, it conducts heat and electricity. Right? And because aluminum checks off all of these, it fits into the metal category. Okay. Whereas, say, like, um, say, um, what's a good example here? Silicon. Silicon is a good conductor. Silicon might be uh, durable, but silicon is not, say, very strong. You get what I'm saying there? So anything that's, like, wishy-washy where it has half of them, they go in that category. So quick recap here. I need you to guys know, need to know how to label parts of the periodic table. Okay. The first ones are, can you tell me whether it's natural or synthetic? Can you handle that? Second one, can you tell me whether it's solid, liquid, or gas? Okay, I didn't mention that, but I mean, there's a legend on your, on your table here. Okay. If it's yellow, it's a non-metal. Sorry, if it's yellow, it's a metal solid. If it's green, it's a non-metal or, or like metalloid solid. If it's blue, it's a gas. If it's... Um, Red, it's a liquid. And then can you tell me whether it's a metal, a non-metal, or a metalloid? So those are some of the first categories we need. The next way that we sometimes group the table, I'm going to close that back door. <laughs> I wonder whether they're thinking the same thing. I'm super loud. Lab is so animated. <laughs> okay, in 1890, whatever it was, 1860 something, whenever Mendeleev did his periodic table, what's the day again? 1869. When man Mendeleev made his first periodic table, this is actually the first thing that Mendeleev did. He created groups, and we actually still use this word to this day. He literally wrote down on a card properties of elements. And so he would have recorded things like, Helium is a gas. Neon is a gas. Argon is a gas. And he recognized, hey, why don't I group them together based on similar properties? Does that make sense? And in doing so, we actually still call them groups to this day because what he did is he put everything that had a similar property in a column. Okay. And we actually recognize this on our current periodic table. I'd like to, if I could, start. I'm not going to go to the back here, but can you guys find the first column right here on your table? You may even want to write this on your periodic table. Everything in the first column, we call an alkali metal. And one of the reasons why they were grouped together is they all react very similarly with water. Everything in this first column reacts very similarly with water. They all explode, actually. I'm going to show you sodium and water in one of our labs. It's pretty cool. One of the things you guys might notice, actually, if you were to take a look at this first column here, hydrogen, Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, francium. There is one number on here that's the same for all of them. Can you guys see how each one of those ones has a plus one? 
in the corner. We'll talk about charges a little bit later, but one of the reasons why all of these go together is because they all have a plus one charge. That was something similar. And because it was similar, Mendeleev put them in a group. So the first column is known as the alkali metals. Okay. Alkali metals. It's actually written right there. Alkali metals. Okay. Now take a look at the second column down. Can you guys see what's the same in all of those elements? They're all plus two. Yeah, again, Mendeleev recognized that, hey, let's put, let's group, hence the name group, let's group things together based on similar properties. And since everything in the second column has a plus two charge, they went together. And as you guys look at this, you can kind of see, well, hang on, look at the next row. Row, uh, column three, they're all plus threes. Look at the fourth row. They're all plus, well, minus one of them, they're all plus fours. This is what Mendeleev did. He started recognizing similarities and grouped them together. Okay. So now at the start of the table over here, group one and group two, we give them names called alkali metals or alkali earth metals. On the opposite side, if you go way over to the far right-hand side, there's also some groups that we give special names to. If I could, I'd like to start with the very, very last one. Can you guys find helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon? What's similar in all of that last row? They all have no charge, but more than that, they're also all gases. Yeah. Yeah, and so we actually have a name for them. The name for them, we call them either the noble gases, or sometimes you might hear the word called the inert gases. Okay. Brief aside, does anybody know what the word inert means? We don't use it in, in English language much. Does anybody know what inert means? Do you know? Inert means non-reactive. Okay. If something is inert, it means it doesn't react. Okay. One thing that's unique about everything in that final column there is all of these things right here, they never form compounds. They never react with anything else. And there's actually a reason why we call them that. We call them the noble gases because, like, historically, if you were a noble, if you were, like, a duke or a king or, a, you know, if you had high esteem, you would not hang out with peasants. You guys ever talk about that in, like, social studies about, like, the, the feudal system and societies? We actually call these things noble gases because... Like the nobles, they don't hang out with anybody else. Everybody in that final column doesn't react, ever. They don't ever make compounds. So that's why they went together. Uh, the other one that has a special name you guys should know is in, in group 17. Uh, one thing I don't think I pointed out yet, can you guys see how along the very, very top here, they literally number them from 1 through to 18 here? We, we call them group 1, group 2, group 3. So group 17, the second last column right here, is uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. These ones right here, we call them the halogens. Okay. And they also all react very similarly. I'm going to go to the back here one more time here. Okay, Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. These guys are all part of a group. What, what about these two guys right here? Yeah, they actually really kind of fit right here. So these two guys right here, are not part of this group right here. Because remember, these things right here, this number 71 should actually go right there. So don't think that this row keeps going down and includes these two guys right here. Does that make sense? Same thing with this one right here. But this is what Mendeleev did. He started putting them together in rows like this. Okay. Now here's the question. Why did he come up with 18 rows? Or, or sorry, not rows. Why did he come up with 18 columns? For what reason did he have to make it 18? Why couldn't he have made 16 groups? Why couldn't he have made 25 groups? Now, that's a good question, right? He has like 90-something, 100-something cards, and he starts putting them together. And some groups, you might notice, have like if... I should almost stay at the back. Some groups, as you go down... They have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements in them. Right? But other groups, as you go down, they have like, say, one, two, three, four elements in them. They're not all a consistent size. So then you might ask the question, well, why did we choose to go with 18 groups and some have six and some have seven and some have four? Right? So that's on my next slide. Although they're organized in groups up and down, they're also organized in something called a period. Lost my board connection here. There we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
we also organize them into things called periods. And there are seven periods. There are seven like rows on the table. And I've already mentioned this. Across like this is row number one. This one is row number two. This one is row number three, row number four, row number five, row number six, row number seven. And I already pointed this out. This is not row eight and nine because really these guys like fit in here. Okay. So then the question, well, why did we go with 18 by 7? What logic was there to that? And this goes back to the story of Ernest Rutherford. So I want to review yesterday. Rutherford had this idea. He shot particles at gold foil. You guys remember the story from yesterday? You would think that if you throw something at the wall, it would hit it and just bounce off. But most of the particles phased through, which then, okay, that's confusing. Why are they phasing through? Ah, new idea. What if there's a nucleus? And Rutherford had this brand new idea of what if rather than particles being like these billiard balls that would line up next to each other, if I were to try to shoot something at this, I would totally expect it to bounce off. Rutherford's idea was a planet. He suggested what if there was a nucleus of stuff in the middle, and what if the electrons went around it in orbits? So what if it looked like this? Well, then if I were to shoot something at it, it would phase right through, but once in a blue moon, it would actually deflect off. You guys recall the story from yesterday? Okay, so I want to talk about where this fit in. Eventually, Rutherford realized his, his theory was totally wrong. Okay, I don't need you to really know the reasons why, but he, he knew he was wrong right off the bat. It has to do with the fact that electrons that are moving give off radiation. Okay, um, It's actually how like Wi-Fi signals are given off, actually. Beside the point. Okay. Um, he knew he was wrong, and so Nels Bohr came up with an idea, and he called them energy levels. And you may want to write this one down here, because we've used that word before. And it's this crazy idea that literally electrons will jump from one level to the next. Okay. We still sometimes draw them as circles, but the idea was, is if this is your nucleus and this is your energy level, the idea was that the electron would never be found right here. The electron is either in this energy level or it's in this energy level. And literally, if it needs to move from one level to the next, it teleports. Crazy, crazy cool stuff. If you like physics, come talk to me. I love talking physics. But here's where this relates together. The reason why there are seven rows in the periodic table is because scientists have discovered seven energy levels. Okay. So in terms of these orbitals, this picture right here, would you guys agree with me that I've drawn one two different rings around the nucleus right here. Okay, There are seven known rings. So if I really wanted to take some time and draw this out nicely, here's a nucleus. Here's the first energy level. Here's the second energy level. Here's the third energy level. Here's the fourth energy level. Fifth energy level. I didn't do a very good job of this today. What was that to? Five? Six? Seven? Okay. Each one of our rows references an energy level. And so if an element is in that row, it tells you which energy levels are in use. Okay. So let me give you an example here. Can everybody on their periodic table find number 13? It's aluminum. We'll go with that one. Number 13. Aluminum is number 13. Okay. Now, aluminum, here's the way aluminum works. Aluminum uses the first row. See how the first row, it's used up. So it actually uses the first energy level. Aluminum is actually in the third row. So it also uses the second energy level. And because it's in the third row, aluminum is using the third energy level. Does that make sense? So although there's seven energy levels available, aluminum is using three of them. Does that make sense at all? Okay. Now, the electrons are actually possible. They can actually jump from this energy level to that energy level. That's actually possible. Side note, this is actually how fireworks work. I don't know if you guys know this, but the reason why fireworks give off such cool light is what ends up happening is we heat up cool compounds. And I'll show you this if you take chemistry with me more one day. As we heat them up, what ends up happening is electrons get heated up. They, they, the electrons move from this energy level up to this one, up to this one, up to this one. And then as it cools back down again, they fall back to where they came. And in doing so, they actually give off light. Okay. I'll teach you that more later if you want. But the point I need to make here is that the electrons can jump from level 1 to level 2 to level 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7. 
that's why we have 18 by 7. Does that make sense? Is that there's 17, sorry, there's 7 known energy levels where electrons can be. And they can jump from one to the next. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these atoms now. Okay, yesterday we talked about the idea of a nucleus, but I didn't use as much terminology as I'd like to. In the nucleus are found some of the subatomic particles. There are three subatomic particles. Have I mentioned these before to you guys? There are electrons, and I usually write those with an E negative. That's the short way that I write them, because electrons have a negative charge. Another subatomic particle is known as a proton. I usually write that as a P positive. It's a short way I can write proton. There's also one more type of subatomic particle. It's known as a neutron. And I often write that with an N and a zero. Because these guys are negative. These guys are positive. And these guys are neutral. Okay. And those are the three subatomic particles. So if I look at this picture that I've got right here, what I need you guys to know is that in the nucleus, that's where we find the protons and the neutrons. They're found in that densely compacted little area. This is actually a good example of that whole energy level. See how this is like the first energy level, the second energy level, the third energy level, the fourth energy level. They didn't bother drawing the fifth, sixth, and seventh, by the way. But see how the electrons are kind of in these energy levels right here? Do they actually orbit? No, we know they don't actually orbit, but we call them orbitals sometimes, just because that's what Rutherford first came up with. So the protons and neutrons are found compacted in this nucleus, and the electrons are found in those energy levels. And I have that on this next slide here. So neutrons are neutral, electrons are negative, protons are positive. So what I want to do now is introduce to you another vocabulary word. We're using a lot of vocabulary words today. The word is called an atom. And you have already heard the word atom before. But I want to make sure I'm very clear on what I mean when I refer to an atom. An atom is always neutral. An atom is always neutral. Okay? Which means if we're ever referring to an atom, the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. These two things have to be the same as each other. Because really, electrons are negative and protons are positive. So if you have six negatives, you better have six positives. Because can you guys kind of see how six negatives and six positives would like balance to zero? Okay. That's a really key thing here is that atoms have to be neutral. Okay. I've got a couple of pictures here. Okay. Take a look at oxygen. If you guys can find oxygen on your periodic table, O, oxygen is number eight. Now, the one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that the reason why oxygen is number eight is that it has eight protons. That number that we number it by, that we call the atomic number, it tells you how many protons somebody has. So if oxygen is number eight, it must have eight protons. If magnesium is number 12, it must have 12 protons. So that number up in the top corner, what it tells you is how many protons somebody has. Okay? It is what identifies the species. Let's try a quick little game here. If I were to ask you who has 26 protons, can you tell me who has 26 protons? Yeah, iron. It's number 26 because it has 26 protons. Can you guys find that? Iron is right there, number 26. Okay. So that big number that we've been talking about, more than just being the atomic number, it tells you how many protons it has. Now, here's the real key then. If it's an atom, protons equals electrons. So I want you guys to look at these pictures here now. If oxygen has eight protons, because it's number eight, add up the electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. See how there's eight protons that I kind of wrote right here in the nucleus? And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. Watch the next one here. Magnesium. Magnesium is number 12. How do I know magnesium is number 12? Well, I literally go to my table, I find magnesium, and it's number 12. If it's number 12, it means it has 12 protons. 
Well, if a magnesium atom has 12 protons, it better also have 12 electrons. And now count these off. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Check this out, though. See how this guy right here only needed two energy levels? And this guy right here needed one, two, three energy levels? Why does this guy need more energy levels than this guy? Because it has more electrons. Yeah, and that actually makes sense, is that as we get bigger in number, if the proton number increases, guys, can you pay attention, please? If the proton number is increasing, well, then so does the electron number. And the electrons, as we get more and more electrons, require a new level for them. Okay. What we've discovered is that the first energy level holds two electrons. And I'm going to go to the back again here. I really need this thing at the front. The first energy level can only hold two electrons. And look at this. In this first energy level, there are two elements there. The second energy level only holds eight electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The third energy level holds eight electrons. I like to give an analogy of it being like a like a hotel. Okay. Imagine that that all of these energy levels are like a hotel. In the first floor of the hotel, there's two rooms. As soon as those two rooms are filled up by electrons, you need a new level. And in the next level, there are eight available spots. Now, oxygen right here only is using up one, two, three, four, five, six of them. But if you guys look at magnesium, in the first level, it uses up two electrons. In the second level, it uses up all eight. As soon as this level is full, electrons now need to go to the next energy level. And so the basic idea is, as we increase in protons, Augusta, here, focus, guys. As we increase in protons, we also increase in electrons. Where are the protons found? The nucleus. Where are the electrons found, though? In energy levels. As we add more electrons, we need new energy levels. And as soon as an energy level becomes full, that's why we have a new row on the table. Does that make sense? As soon as an energy level becomes full, that's how we decided to now have a new row on the table. So there are certain elements that are actually full of electrons. Their orbitals are full. These are actually the guys at the very, very end of the table. Helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. And the reason why they're full is that helium has filled his first level. Neon has filled his second level. Argon has filled the third level. And that's actually why they don't react. We'll, we'll explain that more in the future. I have to do a little at a time. Hopefully that made some sense. Okay. Long story short, I need you guys to be aware of this. Okay. Of the three atomic things, there's protons, which are positive, electrons, which are negative, and neutrons, which are neutral. These guys are compacted in the nucleus, but the electrons, they're the ones that are orbiting around in orbitals. Okay. So this is the last thing we're going to do, and then I'm going to be done for the day. I need for you guys to be able to identify three things. I need you to be able to identify how many protons you need, how many neutrons you need, and how many electrons you need. Okay. And I've got some bolded words to help us out here. The first one's really easy. If you want to figure out how many protons somebody has, that's literally what number it is. Okay. So like, how many protons does hydrogen have? One, because it's number one. How many protons does chlorine have? 17 because it's number 17. That's like the easiest thing you can do. All you gotta do to figure out protons is find its number on the table. That's how many protons it has. Yeah. Um, I have many of them, but no, not the whole thing. Not by any means. Uh, Tachinetium, I think. I don't know them all though. I really don't. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't do that for most. Okay. The next word I need you guys to know is called an isotope. You guys stay with me here? The next word I need you to know is called an isotope. It's actually possible to have different numbers of neutrons. Okay? Some things have one neutron, some have two, some have three, some have 74. Neutrons are neutral. Neutrons mean that you can have more or less of them, and it doesn't really change the charges of the atoms. And so it's actually possible for one hydrogen, for example, to have one neutron, but to have another hydrogen over there that doesn't have a neutron. Okay. Way back in our notes, I talked about John Dalton, and Dalton had a theory. He believed that this calcium over here must be exactly the same as this calcium over here. That was his theory. 
if this is calcium and this is calcium, they must be the exact same. It's actually not true. And the reason why is this calcium over here and this calcium over here, although they both have 20 protons, why, why do they both have 20 protons? Because calcium is number 20. This calcium here could have 21 neutrons. This one over here could have 23 neutrons. Neutrons don't matter. What identifies a substance is its protons, but you could have more or less neutrons in each compound. And so you can actually have a heavier version of each element. And so we call those isotopes. And I'm going to show you this in a few slides here. We can tell what isotope something is based on what's called a mass number. Last thing, electrons help us figure out whether something is charged or not. If you're talking about an atom, atoms have protons and electrons. Oops, that's wrong. Atoms have protons and electrons equal to each other. But where are the protons found? In the nucleus. Nucleuses are actually notoriously hard to break apart. It actually takes like a nuclear reactor to do that. But electrons, electrons are found floating around in those orbitals. It's actually very easy to steal a couple of electrons or add a couple more. And so if you can either have more electrons or elect less electrons, it forms a charge which makes something called an ion. So my last goal for the day is I want to walk you guys through these three things here, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And I want to be able to solve kind of a puzzle that's going to look like this. I'm going to skip ahead to my last slide. I do this once in a while. Can you guys find the very last slide here? I'm going to go back through the notes I skipped in a bit here, but sometimes I find it's better if I just show you what we're going to try to work on first. Okay. What I'd like to do here is I'd like us to figure out three things. Okay. First, I want to figure out the identity of the atom. We want to know who it is. Secondly, we're going to figure out something called a mass number, which is known as an isotope. And then thirdly, we're going to figure out whether it has a charge or not. Okay. Three things. Identity, mass number, and charge. And I, I'm just going to do one or two of them with you, see how you pick up on this. If someone has 17 protons, can we figure out who that is on our periodic table? Yeah, 17 protons means it's number 17. So number 17 is chlorine. So right off the bat, I know that this is chlorine. That makes sense? All because chlorine is number 17. Okay, the next thing I want us to figure out is what's called the mass number. The mass number basically refers to how heavy is this? Okay. And the heaviness is based on the nucleus. Which things were in the nucleus? The protons, the neutrons, or the electrons? And the neutrons. Both of these were in the nucleus. So the way you calculate a mass number is you literally add these two numbers together. So we're going to call this a chlorine 37. The reason I have 37 is that it's 17 plus 20. A mass number is basically how heavy it happens to be. Now, I, I want to do a brief aside here. What if I were to give you chlorine 36? What would chlorine 36 have for protons? It still has 17 protons. That's what makes it chlorine. But if it only adds up to 36, this guy must have had 19 neutrons and 17 protons. Because these two things together, they add to this. So you can add or subtract neutrons all you want, but you have to tell me how heavy it is when you're done. That makes sense? So these two numbers add up to give what's called a mass number. Now the last thing we've got to do is figure out whether we're talking about an atom, which is neutral, or an ion, which has a charge. And what you have to do now is compare protons, which are positive, to electrons, which are negative. Are they the same number as each other? No. Who wins this fight between electrons and protons? If there was like a big battle royale, who has the extra man on their team? Chlorine, right? Sorry, chlorine. Electrons. <laughs> electrons do, right? What I mean by this then is that chlorine is going to have a negative one charge. It's going to be a negative one ion. And the reason why it's negative one is because there's one more electron than there is a proton. You guys think you're able to follow that first one there? I'm going to try all five of these, and then I'm going to go back to my notes and try to re-explain it. But sometimes I find it works best if I go right to the like the doing examples, and then I loop back again. So let's try another one here. If I ask you for someone who has 10 protons, who does it have to, have to, have to be? Number 10 is neon. Okay. 
and I know it's neon identity wise because it has 10 protons. Okay. Now, it could have 11 neutrons or 12 neutrons or three neutrons or 500 neutrons for all I care. Neutrons don't impact who it is. All it impacts is how heavy it is. So how heavy is this particular neon? 21. The reason why it's 21 is that in our nucleus, we only care about the nucleus, by the way, there are 10 of these and 11 of these. So the grand total from 10 and 11 is 21. Okay. Could it be neon 22? What would neon 22 mean? There'd be 12 neutrons. But is it still neon if there's 12 neutrons? Sure. What makes it neon? That. The, the 10 protons. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Oh, wait, last question. If we had a battle royale, a big fight between your protons and electrons, who wins? Nobody. It's a tie. So in this case here, we would call this an atom, because atoms are neutral. Ions have either more or less electrons, for whatever reason, but atoms are neutral. So we would call this a neon with a mass of 21. We call it an atom. Let's try another one. Seven protons. So who has seven protons? Number seven is nitrogen. All right, now, by virtue of it being number seven, can I do all three of these at once, actually? Because can you guys see how all three of them have seven protons? All three of those are going to be nitrogen. All three of these are going to be nitrogen. Why are all three of them nitrogen? Well, they all have seven protons. How heavy is this particular nitrogen, though? Seven plus eight will give you 15, yeah. Now, this guy right here is still nitrogen. Why is he nitrogen? Because of his seven protons. But he had picked up an extra neutron. He's now nitrogen 16. But you know what? They're still both nitrogen. This is where John Dalton was wrong. Dalton thought that all nitrogens were the exact same. He thought if there's a nitrogen here and a nitrogen here, they were exactly identical. He's actually wrong. You can be nitrogen in both cases, but have different numbers of neutrons because they're neutral. What about this last one? What's the mass of this one? Still 16, right? Because 7 and 9 and 7 and 9 is still 16. But the difference I want to make here is now about whether it's an ion versus an atom. See how this one has 7 protons and 7 electrons? Because it's the same, this guy is an atom. This one is 7 and 7 as well. This one here is also an atom. What about this one here? See how there's seven protons and eight electrons? This is an ion, and we would call it a negative one ion because you have one more electron than protons. Well, what would happen if the protons wins the battle? Then it would be plus one. Yeah. Like as an example here, let's say I gave you 20 protons, 21 neutrons, and 18 electrons. This would be calcium because it's number 20. It would be calcium 41 because that's what happens when you add these together. But because there's more protons than electrons, it is a plus 2 ion. Does that make sense? Okay. Now that I've kind of gotten to the end of the lesson, I like to go back through, and I just want to flip back through the slides that I've kind of skipped and try to explain where these three pieces come from. Okay, But this is ultimately my goal. Can you, using information on protons, neutrons, and electrons, tell me what it is we're talking about? So let me go back through what I skipped, though. So what did I skip? I think I finished about here, right? So if you want to come back to this slide right here, I want to talk about atomic number again. How do you know what something is? It's atomic number. If there's seven protons, we always call it nitrogen. If there's eight protons, we always call it oxygen. Okay? Its name is based on its protons. I have a, a really silly analogy to this. Uh, you guys ever watch the, the Smurfs? My, my daughters, they love the Smurfs right now. They, they like, um, I have girls, right? So they really like uh, Smurfette because it's like the only girl Smurf, fortunately. So anyways, here's my point though. You guys know how the Smurfs, we give them their names based on their, like, their personality, like Grouchy Smurf is called Grouchy Smurf because he's grouchy, and uh, Clumsy Smurf is called Clumsy Smurf because he's clumsy. Okay, in that same analogy here, 
Why do we call something oxygen? Because it has eight protons. Okay? That's why it's been given that name. Everything with eight protons is called an oxygen. Now, it could have more or less neutrons. It could have more or less electrons. But the reason we name something is based on its protons. Just like in the Smurfs, the reason we name them is based on their personality. I know it's kind of a silly example here, but if you get what I'm trying to say here, you can change the electrons, you can change the neutrons, but the one thing you cannot change is its protons. That's what identifies it. So atomic number is protons. Okay. This is how you identify something. Okay. Now, when we want to talk about neutrons, neutrons helps you find something called the mass number. And we write this in one of two ways. We either write it after the name with a little dash, or we write it in this notation right here. Okay, so I want to explain these two notations here. Okay, take a look at hydrogen. You see how this bottom number right here is always number one? The reason why it's always number one is because hydrogen has one proton. Yeah. This top number right here is known as the mass number, and it tells you how much protons plus neutrons there are. So right here, the number is one. Now, if you already have one proton, you must then have zero neutrons. But let's say this number is number two. If one of them is a proton, and this number adds up to two, there must be one neutron. If this number right here is three, but one of them is a proton, you really have to go three minus one to tell you there's two neutrons, or two minus one, or one minus zero. Can you guys kind of see how the how, how that kind of works there? Is that you have to take the top number, subtract the bottom number, that tells you how many neutrons you have. This bottom number is protons. The top number is both. Let me try another example here. Here's carbon. Carbon is always number six. Well, this carbon adds up to 12. Six plus what gives you 12? Six plus six gets you 12. What if it's number 13? Six plus seven gives you 13. What if it's 14? Six plus eight gives you 14. So we either write it in one of two ways. We either write it in this notation here with like, uh, like say CA 41 over 20. You either write it like this, or you would just call it calcium 41. Either of these kind of makes sense. How many protons does calcium have to have? How many protons does calcium have to have? 20, because it's number 20, which I also knew because I put this number 20 right here. How many neutrons does this calcium have? How'd you get to 21? Yeah. If there's 20 protons and this right here is the total, you have to do a little subtraction and say, well, 20 plus... 21 neutrons would get you to 41. So, can you have extra or fewer neutrons? Sure. Your identity is based on your protons. Just like Grouchy Smurf is grouchy because he's grouchy. No, it's dumb. But protons is what identifies you. For electrons, what I want to do now is talk about something called valence electrons. You know those energy levels we talked about where there's like those seven different orbitals? The last orbital in use, we call those valence electrons. The last orbital in use is called valence electrons. And the basic idea is you can either add more electrons or get rid of electrons. Okay. Some things can pick up extra electrons and fill up their orbitals. Some things can actually lose electrons and, um, and deplete their orbitals. Okay. And based on how that works with your valence electrons, you either form a positive or negative ion. And I want to show you a picture here. Here's a picture of some orbitals. What you might notice here is that in the first row right here, see how there's only one ring? The reason why there's only one ring is because we're in row number one. Here we're in the second row, and you'll notice that everything here has two rings. Here we're in the third row. Everything has three rings. That makes sense? Now, next thing you gotta do is talk about capacity. The first circle has a really limited capacity. It can only have two electrons in it. It's like if it's the hotel analogy, the first floor of the hotel only has two rooms. And so that floor rapidly fills up. 
which is why on your periodic table, we put one hydrogen right here and one helium right there, and that, that's it for the first row. The second row has a capacity of eight. So lithium uses one, beryllium uses two, you can see boron uses three, carbon uses four, nitrogen uses five, oxygen uses six, fluorine was seven, and eventually neon gets to eight. And as soon as it is full, well, there's not room for nine, so then that's why it has to go start a new level. Now, what I want to talk about here is something called the valence electrons. This guy right here would be considered a valence electron. It's the electron in the last energy level. These two guys right here are not valence electrons because they're not in the outermost ring. Okay. What we're going to talk more about after our quiz next week is that it's very possible to either lose this electron or gain electrons. That happens all the time with just the outside most electrons. So like, for example, these electrons right here, those are valence electrons. These electrons right here, they are not. And so it's possible for this guy right here, it's possible for aluminum to lose those electrons. Actually happens quite regularly. It's actually possible for chlorine to say, hey, look, I got a free spot right here. Can we put an electron here? So long story short is you can change neutrons and make it heavier or lighter. You can change electrons and make it either positively charged or negatively charged. We call those ions or neutral. But what's the one thing you cannot change? Because that's how you identify yourself. You identify yourself based on protons. That's kind of what this slide right here talks about here, is if you have the same protons as electrons, it's neutral. If not, it's an ion, and we give them little charges in the corner. Um, OK, two last things, and then we'll be done for the day here. If you have something positively charged, how do you make something positively charged? Some kids would say, well, add more positives. To which I'd say, hang on a sec here. Can you add more positive protons? Doesn't that change who it is? Remember, your identity is based on protons. So if you want to become positively charged, you actually have to lose electrons. The only way to become positive, you can't add more positives, because that changes who you are. But you can lose electrons. So I want to show you an example here. Here's a sodium atom. And I know it's a sodium atom because there's 11 electrons, 11 protons. They're equal to each other. Well, what happens if sodium loses an electron? Sodium would now have still 11 protons, but now there'd only be 10 electrons. Who wins the fight? 11 protons, 10 electrons? The protons win, right? Which is why there is a plus one charge over here. Can you add more protons, though? What if you add one more proton? Let's say there were 11 protons. Let's make there 12 protons. Well, now if there's 12 protons, it's not sodium. We now call it magnesium. Now it's something entirely different. So you can't play with the protons. Uh, we call those, by the way, we call those cations. And I have a really silly way of memorizing that. Cations are positive because, wait for this, cats have paws. <laughs> so bad. Cations are positive because cats have paws. It's brutal, but it works. If something is negative, here's how that would look. Here's a chlorine atom. It has 17 of each. Okay. But what if chlorine picks up an extra electron somehow? Well, now there's 18 electrons to 17 protons. Now the electrons win the fight. Now there's a negative one charge. We call these things anions. Cations and anions. Let's try, an ex let's try one more example here, and then I'm going to call it a day. I didn't bet you. Let's say that I were to give you this information. Let's say that I told you that you had a, uh, let's see, a fluorine 21 negative 1 ion. Let's say I gave you this information. Could you guys tell me how many protons there are, how many neutrons there are, how many electrons there are? I just want to try this one together as a group, and then I'll call it a day. How do I know how many protons fluorine has? You look for fluorine. So it takes a little while at first, by the way, because I know you guys aren't overly familiar with the periodic table. But once you get better at it, you'll, you'll know where to look. Fluorine is number nine. So because it's fluorine, there are nine protons. So far, so good. 
All right, now for the number 21. The 21 will tell us how many neutrons there are. If 9 of this 21 is a proton, then the neutrons better be 12. And the reason I know that is because 9 plus 12 gets me 21. Or I guess you could just say 21 minus 9 gets you the 12. Now, do all fluorines have 12 neutrons? No, some have 13, some have 14, some have 11, some have 2. You know what I'm saying here? What makes it fluorine is its protons. Just like what makes him grumpy is the fact that he's grumpy. Good stuff. Oh, right, last thing here, electrons. If you're going to have a negative one ion, should there be nine of each? No, because then that would be an atom. So if there's a negative one left over, this guy right here better be... Don't hear that every day. This better be 10, because now there's one more negative than there is positive. That's what makes it an ion. You guys follow that? Okay, uh, I'm going to call it a day now, because I want to give you guys about 10 minutes or so, whatever we have left here to do some work. Here's the plan. Okay, I've now taught you guys four lessons. Okay, if you were to buy into my learning cycle thing right here, guys, focus, please. I'm almost done. I've tried to do the knowledge part here. Okay, but if you guys really do want to do well, you guys now need to try it. Okay, I don't think you can just watch and go, yeah, I think I got it. Okay, so there are three things you should work on. Okay. First one, your lab safety project. Second one, the lab we did. The third one, the assignment. Okay. Guys, if I can give you some advice. How do you study for our quiz on Monday? By doing the tasks I give you. Good. If you guys do your assignment before Monday and mark it yourself, that's usually how kids do better because then they can get themselves instant feedback and so you know whether you're doing it right or wrong. Okay. So the best advice I would give you guys is try to finish these tasks before the weekend. That's, that's how you do your studying. Right? But at the very least, try to mark yourself your own assignment so that you know how well you're doing. You guys get what I'm saying here? Okay. You have like ew, 10 minutes, give or take, today. And then you guys are going to have all of tomorrow to work. So that means you guys are going to have like an hour and a half, give or take. Okay? Work on those three things. And call me over as you need help. Let me try to help refine things. Okay? But the most important thing now is work on the application stage, but also get feedback. Okay? If you're just going to sit there and do nothing, you're not going to learn. Okay? Okay, I'm done.